I'm going to start with my opening statement, then I'll turn it over to Senator Barrasso for his, and then by then we'll have hopefully one more ready to roll. Uh, I was highly impressed by Mr. Turk at our hearing last week. He clearly has a firm grasp on the wide range issues facing the Department of Energy. He's going to bring a wealth of practical experience to the job of Deputy Secretary. He started his career working in the Senate for our former colleague, Kent Conrad, who speaks very highly of him. He then worked on the Senate Judiciary Committee for Senator Biden. He held a series of national security and foreign affairs jobs in the House, in the State Department, and at the National Security Council. He spent two years as a Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of Energy, and he has spent four years in senior positions at the International Energy Agency, including the last 14 months as Dr. Faith Brawls deputy. Quite simply, Mr. Turk has spent the last 20 years serving in important jobs that have given him the technical knowledge and the practical experience in energy, national security, and management that he will need to help Secretary Granholm lead the Department of Energy. And I believe his performance at our hearing last week demonstrated that he has the knowledge and ability to serve in this important position in an unbiased way. He is supremely well qualified for the job, and I do heartily support his nomination. Let me recognize Senator Brasso to make his statement at this time. Senator? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree. Today, our committee will vote on the nomination of David Turk to serve as Deputy Secretary of Energy, and if confirmed, he'll play a critical role in our nation's energy agenda and in uh, leading the department. His experience in energy policy, I believe, is extensive. He served in leadership positions at the International Energy Agency, U.S. Department of Energy, Department of State, and the National Security Council. During his nomination hearing, um, he said that he was dedicated to all types of American energy and the need to keep America energy dominant. He stated he wanted to work with our committee to support the development and expansion of American carbon capture technologies, nuclear power, and critical minerals. I especially appreciated his commitment to carbon capture utilization and sequestration technologies, as well as the need to construct CO2 pipelines to move that captured carbon. During his hearing, he said, quote, there are huge opportunities on CCUS if we can work together and really go to scale. I agree. Republicans and Democrats worked together last Congress to pass the Use It Act, bipartisan legislation to support carbon capture technologies, including air capture and the construction of CO2 pipelines. At the Integrated Test Center outside Gillette, Wyoming, groundbreaking research is already taking place on carbon capture technologies. These are the types of efforts that the Biden administration should be embracing and fully support. Mr. Turk uh, was also responsive to the committee's written questions for the record. Uh, this has not been the case with every one of President Biden's nominees so far. If confirmed, Mr. Turk must pr uh, prioritize policy policies uh, that take advantage of the tremendous economic and national security benefits generated by an abundant oil, natural gas, and coal resources that we have. So far, the Biden administration has declared war on American energy and implemented policies that have thrown energy workers out of work. Coal, oil, and natural gas are not going away. We're going to continue to rely on these abundant and affordable resources for decades to come. That's a fact. We need to promote every kind of American energy and the jobs they support. The Biden administration has told oil, natural gas, and coal workers that they can get new jobs as solar panel technicians. If these jobs even exist, the Biden administration would be asking these workers to take an enormous cut in pay. According to the Houston Chronicle, Rick Levy, who is the president of Texas AFL-CIO, the state's largest labor union, has said, quote, someone working in a refinery, leaving to go install solar panels, they're probably going to take a 75% pay cut. It's unacceptable. If confirmed as Deputy Secretary of Energy, Mr. Turk must prioritize policies that are focused on maintaining America's energy dominance. This includes U.S. production of oil, natural gas, and coal. The Biden administration policies have taken a sledgehammer to Western state economies. I've already, it's really already having real impacts on the lives and livelihoods of the people of my home state of Wyoming, many other states represented on this committee. America needs an all the above energy strategy that includes coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear power, and renewables. Mr. Turk, to me, demonstrated that he understood that reality during his nomination hearing. I will hold him and the Biden administration accountable to the commitments that he made to support and expand carbon capture and nuclear power. So, Mr. Pre uh, Mr. Chairman, I will support his nomination. Thank you, Senator Brasso. Uh, do we have any other members that would like to uh, 
make a statement or be heard, then I would encourage you, if you do, please do so, because we're waiting on one more member to come before we vote. <laughs> uh, any members wishing to? I can't believe it. With that, we're going to go in opening statements on the... Uh, Should we vote? Did you? We need to vote. We don't have a quorum. Oh, okay. You don't have a quorum. Okay. I'm, I'm encouraging all of our senators who usually have something to say, <laughs> to say something. <laughs> Going once. Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> there we go. I knew we'd have a taker. Senator Kawa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Obviously, we so appreciate you and the ranking member uh, filling having a hearing to fill these important posts. While um, we have made progress at the Hanford DF law site, uh, the next, uh, this current slate of deputy and other directors at DOE will still have a very big role in moving us forward on cleanup at the Hanford Nuclear yeah. Reservation. So I encourage any of my colleagues who want to delve more into that or visit, I, I am inviting you and the ranking member to come specifically to the Tri-Cities. We've already invited the secretary and uh, the nominee before us. And this is just such a big responsibility for the United States, really, really, you know, in the two billion a year range. And I know it's hard for people to imagine, but uh, we called on this part of the country to do their job during World War II. And yeah, you ought to explain because you they, have you have the history on this to some of our newer members about Hansford. Well, what think, role it played and what, what we left them with. You know, I mean, obviously, I my colleague from New Mexico could also talk about the role that they played, and you know, other colleagues could talk about the uh, uh, our former colleague Senator Alexander could discuss it. But the the point is now we're also left with the cleanup responsibilities and why that exists within the state of Washington. It is not the state of Washington's responsibility. It's a federal responsibility. The state of Washington, I think, does a good job at, in the tri-party agreement, trying to hold us all accountable on meeting certain milestones so we can keep, get it cleaned up. And so um, I also appreciate that the secretary yesterday um, made further announcements at the PNNL lab on uh, battery and storage capacity research that the national labs are doing there. So they're playing their part. We've got to get the cleanup done and move on to the other challenges that, that we face. So I very much appreciate this nominee's uh, commitment during the Q&A about his commitment to making sure that they would live up to those milestones. And as I said, it's a very complex problem that oftentimes people think there's just got a, be a better way to do it or do it on the cheap. Well, there just isn't. And so we just, we have to, we made great progress on the facility. Now we have to get it operational. So I hope that uh, anybody who wants to c come and visit there, I encourage you to do so. Uh, um, there is, I think with my colleague from New Mexico, we did create a national historic park between our three the three locations in the United States to tell this story. And I think we have a little more work to do on that as well. I think we have to do a little more work with DOE and our national park system to uh, make those sites more accessible to the public, which obviously is a challenge because it's a security area as well as, as well as something we want the public to have access to. So Mr. Chairman, I'm hoping that we've found another member or that they're on their way. Uh, if not, we have Senator Daines to help us through this right now. Senator Daines. Mr. Chairman, I'm always here to help you in the time of need here. Um, it's, it's rare that you need to plead with senators to say something. I um, never thought I'd ever see the no, day. No, uh, it's true. Well, I, I just uh, want to uh, let the committee know and let you know, Mr. Chairman, I plan on supporting Mr. Turk's uh, nomination. Uh, I found the interaction I had with him refreshing, uh, pragmatic, uh, he, uh, he definitely has demonstrated the knowledge and willingness to, to work on both sides of the aisle. Uh, in, in fact, this hearing that we're gonna be going into next, Mr. Chairman, I think will demonstrate why we need Mr. Turk's pragmatism as we look at, as Senator Barrasso said, this more of an all of the above energy portfolio moving forward. Uh, I, I used to be an operations guy before I got involved in public service, understanding what it means to have to meet peak capacity and peak load requirements. As uh, one engineer once told me, he said, um, if you think about a family of three and trying to develop a capacity plan for how many uh, beds they need, uh, some might say, well, you only need one because on average you sleep eight hours a night. 
but uh, the reality is it's all about the peak load, not about averages. And as we just saw what happened in this recent cold snap in a place like Montana in February, it happens every winter uh, where we have the, the wind stops blowing, the temperatures plummet. And if it weren't for the fact that we had uh, an all above energy portfolio, we would have had rolling brownouts or blackouts in places like Montana. We got close. We see the same things happen in the summertime when uh, high pressure systems move in, demand goes way up, uh, wind stops blowing, and consequently, you've got to have a uh, diverse portfolio to meet peak demand. So uh, bottom line is, uh, I really appreciated what he said about critical minerals, about carbon capture, how we can work together here to work on reducing emissions, as well as ensuring we've got reliable and affordable energy. So I'll plan to support Mr. Turk, and um, thanks for the time to speak, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Okay. Um, Senator Heinrich, I'm sorry. Oh, I just thought since, you know, we have so much extra time here, we'll, well wait on our colleague. <laughs> oh, Senator I just <laughs> want to say I, I want to thank you for holding this hearing today because I think it's going to be very instructive. Um, one of the things that uh, hasn't been particularly well covered is that uh, during the freeze up in Texas that natural gas production actually fell by 45%. Uh, so it's a little more complicated than just uh, a diverse portfolio. There's a lot of water in natural gas in the Permian Basin. And when you don't winterize things, it literally freezes up. And so we saw, and uh, you know, natural gas just could not uh, in Texas fill the gap because of the freeze ups. And so irrespective of what happened in the first few days with regard to electricity generation, um, there, there are a lot of lessons to be learned about winterizing all of our infrastructure, about planning for the incredibly extreme weather events that we're now experiencing on a regular basis, and, uh, and why, having gone through this in 2011, uh, we went through the same thing uh, just weeks ago. So I very much appreciate you calling this hearing, and I'm looking forward to getting into some of those details um, a little more deeply than maybe Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity. We got a great, we got a great panel coming up too. We're, I think we'll enjoy. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, listened, you know, closely to Mr. Turk um, and, you know, looked at his record, uh, particularly about climate change and renewable energy. Um, I come from a, a prior life where uh, part of my, you know, job, um, we lived at a place on the International Space Station that is powered exclusively by renewable energy, solar power. Uh, I also happen to come from a state uh, that has a uh, uh, rather large and growing solar power industry. Um, and it's critical to our economy. And, you know, when I think back to my you know, first space flight, and I remember flying over uh, South America and looking down at um, at the a at at the Amazon, and what you notice is this big, long copper color river going through the the jungle. And fast forward about ten years later, and I'm on my fourth space flight, and you look down over the same part of the planet. What do you think you notice? It's not the river. You notice the deforestation, and we put a lot of carbon up into our atmosphere. Um, and we continue to do that. I think we've gone from about 250 or so parts per million of CO2 pre-industrial revolution to about 415 or so today. I think those numbers are kind of close. Uh, what that means for our state, if we continue on the business as usual plan, uh, in the year 2100 or so, we're going to have twice as many degree, twice as many days in Phoenix over 100 degrees. It's a big, big change. So it's obviously, you know, we have to do something about it. One of the solutions. It's not everything, but it's solar. Um, we've got supply chain issues uh, that we have to address to continue to grow uh, our solar in industry in the state and across the country. Um, those supply chain issues often extend to issues with foreign governments, sometimes our adversaries. So we've got to sort that out. Um, there's rare earth uh, minerals that we need access to uh, to grow this industry. Um, there's also trade issues and tariffs, and so it's a complicated thing, but we do know that it works. Uh, and renewable energy uh, and moving to more renewable and 
you know, less carbon-based um, energy is helpful, but it's not the entire solution. We've seen this this past summer in Arizona that we need surge capacity. We have that now, but we also need to be able to reduce demand at times. Uh, our um, utilities have had some success with this. As, I, as I've spoken to the CEOs of, of our major utilities in Arizona, they've been able to dial down the demand with, with connected uh, thermostats. Uh, in, some, in one case, I was told 30,000 homes at one time uh, where the utility could reduce the demand from 30,000, basically turn off the air conditioning in 30,000 homes just temporarily. Um, so there are solutions. Um, the supply chain issues are critical for the state of Arizona and critical to, re to expanding uh, solar pa power across our state. And then cost is another issue. We've got to address that as well because I would say right now, where we have you know tax credits and we've extended these uh, tax credits, it's also it, it's often a challenging uh, economic decision for a family to make if they're going to decide to put uh, solar uh, panels on their roof or even for for small business owners. Got to make this um, more a little bit more attractive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. I'm going to go. Yeah. We're going to go ahead and uh, move to our opening statements on our hearing. We have senators coming, and when we do, we'll take a vote when they appear, okay? Turning now to our hearing, let me begin by saying that I think, uh, I really think that we can all agree that reliable, affordable, and dependable energy is a hallmark of an advanced economy, critical for businesses and residential consumers alike to thrive. Our North American electric grid is a marvel of engineering and the envy of the world. But ongoing and increasing changes in the generation mix and outside forces like cyber threats and weather events that test the grid also highlight the importance of a resilient grid. This topic is squarely within the jurisdiction of this committee, and it's critical that we, state and local governments, and grid operators around the country be two steps ahead in planning for these changes and threats and how to ensure that we strike the right balance between resilience, reliability, and affordability. At the top of everyone's mind is a recent winter storm that brought Siberian weather to much of the country, and West Virginia was not spared. We had over 100,000 people that lost power, mostly due to down distribution lines and poles because of the ice. Um, of course, the impact on Texas has gotten the most publicity, with 4.4 million Texans without power for days, resulting in billions in damages and billions more in sky-high energy bills and tragically, dozens of deaths. I understand the Texas legislature has held several hearings and they're working to get to the bottom of why the Texas grid was so unprepared to weather the storm, as are NERC and FERC. And the Texas grid operator, ERCOT, has provided us with a written statement. I have the written statement here, which I'm gonna ask unanimous consent to enter into the record now, and I encourage all of our members, if you get a chance, to read it. It's pretty interesting. Do I have any opposition? If not, so, so be, we enter it. But let me be clear, today's hearing is not a referendum on Texas. We've seen the impact of extreme weather events to our electric grid across the country, whether that be the 2014 polar vortex, the extreme heat in California last summer, or the extreme cold around the country last month. We need to incorporate all the lessons learned from those events into our future planning, particularly as we can expect both our energy mix and weather patterns to be different in the next decade than they were in the last decade. As part of that future planning, we need to take into account the need for a diverse fuel mix with a broad array of emissions, reducing technologies, and include an honest assessment of where our weak spots are and where we need to invest with an eye to balancing the cost of reliability and the resilience with affordability. I have said time and time again that we need to address climate change and we have to do it through innovation, not elimination. And as a staunch proponent of an all of the above energy policy, I want to emphasize that we need to be thinking about all of our fuel sources. We've got to use all of these resources we have in the cleanest way possible, but we need to be eyes wide open that none of them are 100% immune to weather disruptions, whether that be freezing wind turbines, uh, fr that be freezing wind turbines, disruptions to our natural gas production and delivery systems, 
or frozen coal stockpiles, all which we saw happen just last month. And that may take investment in weatherization and infrastructure, which of course comes with a price tax and leads me back to affordability. Reliable, resilient power does us no good if families and businesses can't afford, can't afford it on a daily basis. And while we typically think about the, this in terms of the cost of a kilowatt hour, we also cannot deny the incredible costs associated with major disruptions. By the time, uh, by that I mean not only the potential loss of life, but also the price tag that comes with scarcity in rebuilding or repairing infrastructure, both energy and otherwise. Although not labeled as such, those costs are passed along to all of us, whether through utility and service bills or through our taxes. We truly can't sacrifice reliability, resiliency, or affordability when it comes to our electricity if we want to continue to thrive. It's incredibly important that we strike the right balance between all of these attributes as we look to the future. There isn't one answer to that equation, but you sure know when you've gotten it wrong. I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses about exactly what happened in recent grid outages events, what lessons we should learn from them, and what we should all be thinking about moving forward to strike the right balance. So I want to welcome our panel, but we're, now we have a quorum, so we're going to go to our vote, and then we'll go right to uh, Senator Brasso for his opening statement, too. And, and I'll introduce our panel just a few minutes later. So if there are no members wishing to be heard further, the question is on reporting favorably the nomination of David M. Turk to be Deputy Secretary of Energy with a recommendation that the nomination be confirmed. <clears throat> the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Manchin. Aye. Mr. Wyden. Aye by proxy. Ms. Cantwell. Aye. Mr. Sanders. Aye by proxy. Mr. Heinrich. Aye. Ms. Hirono. Aye. Mr. King. Aye. Ms. Cortez Masto. Aye by proxy. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Mr. Hickenlooper. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Risch. Aye by proxy. Mr. Lee. Aye by proxy. Mr. Danes. Aye. Ms. Murkowski. Aye by proxy. Mr. Hoban. Aye by proxy. Mr. Langford. Mr. Cassidy. Aye by proxy. Ms. Hyde Smith. Aye by proxy. Mr. Marshall. Aye. On this vote, the ayes are 20 and the noes are zero. The nomination is favorably, favorably reported. This concludes the business meeting and will now turn to our hearing this morning. Let me just finish up by welcoming our, our panel and then Senator Brasso will give his opening statement. <clears throat> I want to thank all of you for taking the time to be here and bringing your expertise to our panel. We'll have Mr. Jim Robb. He's president and CEO of North American Electric Reliability Corporation. We have Mr. Mark Gabriel, administrator and CEO of Western Area Power Administration. We have the Honorable Pat Wood III, CEO of Hunt Energy Network and former FERC and Texas Public Utility Commission chairman. Mr. Michael Schellenberger, founder and president of Environmental Progress. And Mr. Manu Astana, president and CEO of the PJM Interconnection. So I want to thank you all for being with us today in person and virtually, and I look forward to uh, your expert analysis and the discussion today. I'm going to now turn to Senator Brasso for his statement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling this important hearing. We all agree that affordable, reliable, and resilient electric service is essential for every American. Electricity is needed for virtually all aspects of our lives. Uh, that's why I've been a strong advocate for generating electricity from a diverse set of resources, including coal, uranium, natural gas, hydropower, wind, and solar. It's also why I've been especially supportive of energy resources that are capable of generating electricity at all times of the day and night, uh, what is known as base load capacity. And it is why we need to be realistic about the limitations of energy resources such as wind and solar that can't generate electricity all of the time. Increasingly, the national discussion on electricity has centered around a single metric, how much greenhouse gas does a source of electricity produce? The discussion has failed to pay sufficient attention to the questions of reliability, resiliency, and affordability. During last month's cold snap, coal played a critical role in maintaining power in Oklahoma and other states. 
In addition, nuclear power, by one standard, outperformed all other energy sources in Texas, and hydropower was essential to keeping the lights on in western states. We must ensure that our grids can provide electricity at all times and at prices that American families and businesses can afford. The American public deserves to know what policies and measures are necessary to ensure that that happens. The public also deserves to know what policies and measures make that objective much more difficult to achieve. Today's hearings should help address these important issues. Electric systems in this country are among the best in the world, and they are always evolving. The men and women who built and operate them are tremendously capable. These professionals must work today with the grids we have today, and not with the grids that we wish we have for in 15 or 25 years. The blackouts that we witnessed in, Calif in California in 2019 and 2020, as well as the blackouts across the central part of the country last month, are unacceptable. What's also unacceptable are proposals that would make blackouts more likely or more devastating for the American people. For example, President Biden has pledged to, quote, achieve a carbon pollution-free power sector by 2035. This is the goal no state, not even California, has set for itself. President Biden has also pledged to cut, quote, the carbon footprint of our national building stock in half by 2035. Mm -hmm. And to, quote, ensure 100% of new sales for light and medium duty vehicles will be zero emissions. In other words, President Biden wants to saddle our electric grids with the additional burdens of powering our transportation fleet and heating buildings currently served by natural gas or oil. As Bloomberg New Energy Finance report stated last month, the transition to electric heating and transport drives up electricity demand while tremendous growth of wind and solar strain the grid. So President Biden's proposals could concentrate our nation's vulnerabilities to bad weather events, terrorism, or cyber attacks on the electric grid. Rather than learn from the blackouts in California and the blackouts last month, some in Congress are doubling down. Last week, House Democrats introduced a bill to require that the country's power sector be 80% carbon-free in less than 10 years, and 100% carbon-free by 2035. Well, like President Biden's plan, their legislation would also push additional burdens on America's electric grids through the electrification of buildings and vehicles that would otherwise rely on oil or natural gas. We should pursue ways to generate electricity that produces less greenhouse gas emissions. We must not do so at the expense of the reliability, resiliency, or affordability of electric services. That means supporting the continuation and expansion of electricity generation from nuclear power, from hydropower, natural gas, and, and for coal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Now we're going to hear Mr. from Mr. Chairman. Before we start, I'm just curious. I noticed there's no one from ERCOT on our list of witnesses today, and I'm just wondering why that is. Senator Heinrich, it sure wasn't for a lack of inviting him. We invited everybody from ERCOT and spoke to everybody that's still left, which I'm not sure anybody's left. So, uh, uh, so ERCOT chose not to be here today. Uh, well, what they did, they, uh, they needed to remain available uh, to their direct regulators, which is the uh, Texas legislature, and they've been in total statements with them and total uh, confab with them, but um, we're, we're working on that. But I think you're going to enjoy this panel. We have an experienced person, Mr. Rob, who knows it inside and out. So we're looking forward to hearing from him, too. Let's get started now, if you don't mind, with our panel. And we'll start with Mr. Rob, President and CEO of North American Electric Reliable Corporation. Good morning, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee. Thank you for having me here at this very timely hearing. The recent tragic loss of life and human suffering in Texas and the Middle South states starkly demonstrate the essentiality of a reliable electric system. As you know, NERC and FERC have begun to work on a joint inquiry into the root causes of this event. We are committed to quickly getting to the facts as to what actually happened, implementing appropriate measures within our authority, and communicating other implied actions to policymakers and industry. There are three major trends which are fundamentally transforming the bulk power system and challenging our historic reliability paradigms. First, the system is decarbonizing rapidly, and this evolution is, is altering the operational characteristics of the grid. Policies, economics, and market designs are resulting in significant retirements of traditional generation. New investment is increasingly focused on developing carbon-free generation with variable production profiles. 
And in this resource mix, natural, fire gener natural gas fire generation is becoming ever more critical, both for bulk energy to serve load and balancing energy to support the integration of these variable resources. Second, the grid is becoming more distributed. The improved economics of solar is a key example. These smaller scale resources have been deployed on both the bulk electric as well as distribution systems, and in many cases reside behind the meter. And third, the system is becoming increasingly digitized through smart meters and digital control systems. These investments greatly enhance the operational awareness and efficiency of grid operators, but at the same time, it heightens our exposure to cybersecurity risk. And extreme weather, as we have recently experienced this past, uh, past month, stresses this emerging electric system in new and different ways. Our reliability assessments are one important way we evaluate the performance of the grid, identify reliability trends, anticipate challenges, and provide a technical platform for important policy discussion. With growing reliance on variable and just-in-time resources, we are developing more advanced ways to study energy supply risk. Our assessments consistently have identified three regions of the country particularly exposed to these dynamics, California, Texas, and New England. Last August, a massive heat wave across the West caused an energy supply shortage in California in the early evening. Solar energy was ramping down, and the grid operator was unable to import power as planned due to high demand throughout the West. Cal ISO was forced to cut power to approximately 800,000 customers. Among the lessons learned from this event are, one, the critical need for reliable ramping resources to balance load, and second, the need for improved ways to estimate resource availability when the system is under stress. In New England, cold weather exacerbates its dependence on limited pipeline capacity and a handful of critical fuel assets. An early January cold snap in 2018 led to natural gas shortages and fuel oil was burned to preserve reliability. Had that cold snap not abated when it did, the fuel oil inventory would eventually be exhausted and ISO New England almost certainly would have needed to shed load. It was a classic near miss event. Insufficient and inadequate weatherization of generation in Texas and the Middle South states has been a growing concern for us since 2012. After a cold weather event caused load shedding for 3 million customers in Texas in 2011, we developed a winter preparation guideline to focus industry on best practices and started conducting significant outreach on winter preparedness. Following additional extremes and unplanned load shedding in that region in 2018, we concluded that these events could no longer be treated as rare and that a mandatory approach was warranted. As a result, NERC began the process of adding mandatory weatherization requirements into our reliability standards. In addition to these weatherization initiatives, I'd like to leave the committee with four main points to consider. First, more investment in transmission and natural gas infrastructure is required to improve the resilience of the electric grid. Increased utility scale wind and solar will require new transmission to get power to load centers. Next, the regulatory structure and oversight of natural gas supply for the purposes of electric generation needs to be rethought. The natural gas system was not built and operated with electric, reli electric reliability first in mind. Policy action and legislation will likely be needed to assure reliable fuel supply for electric generation. As the critical balancing resource, natural gas is the fuel that keeps the lights on. Third, the electric and natural gas systems must be better prepared for extreme weather conditions, which are frankly becoming more routine. Regulatory and market structures need to support this planning and the necessary investment to assure reliability. And finally, investment in energy storage or alternative technologies needs to be supported to have a viable alternative to natural gas for balancing variable resources. A technology which can be deployed cost-effectively and at massive scale with adequate duration to deal with supply disruption lasting for days rather than hours is required. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, sir. Now we're going to have Mr. Mark Gabriel, Administrator and CEO of Western Area Power Administration. I think we have him by video, Mr. Gabriel. The Western Area Power Administration, a federal power marketing administration responsible for selling and delivering wholesale power from 57 hydroelectric dams to about 700 utilities, military bases, Native American tribes, national laboratories in 15 central and western states. WAPA's territory spans 1.3 million square miles and our 17,236 mile transmission system, one of the largest in the United States, is an integral part of the high voltage power grid in the west that ensures reliable electricity for more than 40 million Americans. 
A mentor once told me early in my career that electrons follow the laws of physics and electricity follows the laws of politics, and really only one of these can be amended. WAPA's system experiences 99.99% uptime, and America possesses the most reliable grid in the world thanks to our professional utility industry overseen by industry and government regulatory agencies, and a common commitment to keeping the lights on, all while a competitive grid keeps costs as affordable as possible. We also operate a resilient system, weathering disruptions like storms, wildlife interactions, vehicle accidents, routine maintenance and emergency situations, and safely returning power to citizens. However, when the system is pushed beyond its limits due to extreme weather, such as Winter Storm Uri or the August 2020 heat wave in California, we experience the consequences of operating and maintaining a competitive grid focused mainly on low cost. On February 15th and 16th, SPP directed rolling blackouts across much of its territory to protect the grid and the communities that rely on it from damaging and prolonged outages. At WAPA, 21 customers experienced outages for an average of 55 minutes and up to two hours. Fortunately, WAPA and the Army Corps of Engineers sent 27,150 megawatt hours of additional hydropower to SPP between February 15th and 18th, enough to power nearly 800,000 homes. In the August 2020 heat wave, WAPA did not lose power, but between August 14th and 15th, WAPA and the Bureau of Reclamation supplied 5,400 megawatt hours of surplus federal hydropower to California to limit the effects of the energy emergency without impacting our customers. In both cases and in the Texas, in Texas, the markets worked according to the design. The grid did not collapse. Load shedding and conservation appeals helped. All available resources were generating, and the prices increased when the megawatts were scarce. However, this also showed the system's weaknesses. First, every form of generation can be disrupted by extreme temperatures. Second, a competitive market can discourage long-term capital investment in reliability and resilience measures. And finally, costs move in both directions in competitive markets, and electricity will flow often at times at impractical prices. WAPA prepares for price fluctuations as well as drought by maintaining a financial reserve at the Treasury, carefully coordinated with our customers, and this is really aimed at avoiding rate shock. Increasingly severe weather disasters are straining the grid, including WAPA's in the 2018 car fire. We are responding to more destructive ice storms, snowstorms, tornadoes, wildfires, and high wind events. We've deployed personnel, equipment, and materials to restore power after hurricanes, typhoons, and volcanoes. Looking forward, we anticipate investing $1.3 billion in our system over the next decade to ensure reliability. Reliability being the confidence that the lights will turn on when we need them. Resilience is the ability to prevent and withstand and recover from disruptive threats and events. Ideally, we'd invest more in resilience, emphasizing defense-critical electric infrastructure, artificial intelligence, hardening facilities, redundant services, black start capabilities, replacing wood with steel, and increasing the movement of energy between the eastern and western grids through the seven interties. Integrating AI, machine learning, and advanced technology solutions into grid operations can improve real-time situational awareness, including knowing what is losing power when electricity is proactively cut to protect the grid, a shortfall today. Today's market structure in some ways disincentivizes utilities from necessary resilience and modernizing investments. In conclusion, power and gas markets in the United States are marvelously efficient at driving out inefficient generating units, increasing financial liquidity, and expanding the sale of electricity. However, the real question is whether electricity and, to a lesser extent, natural gas are logical commodities to participate in open markets. Unlike pork bellies and orange juice, trading electrons has consequences far greater than the availability of bacon or morning refreshment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd be pleased to answer any questions that you or the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Gabriel. Now we're going to have uh, the Honorable Pat Wood. Pat? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Manchin. You have your... Let's see what I need to hear. There you go. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, should, it's been a few years since I've been here. Now I know how to remember how to do it. Senator Heinrich, uh, I'm the I'm the B team. Sorry that ERCOT couldn't be here, but uh, I think we're I can. thrilled to have you. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate being here. 
I was a state and federal regulator, as Chairman Manchin mentioned. Uh, since y'all have saw me last and uh, 16 years ago, uh, as I testified on the Energy Policy Act of 2005 as Chairman of FERC, um, in support of, of uh, the uh, NERC's formalization and the formal role that uh, NERC and FERC would have over reliability of all the continental U.S., um, I've been involved in a, a lot of things that I think bear on what we talk about today, so I'm happy to share any perspective with the committee during any questions. But I've been a wind developer, developed uh, LNG projects. I've been chairman of a company that had coal and gas operations throughout the country, uh, Dynagy. I uh, was a founding board member of SunPower, remain on that board, which is one of the top three solar companies in the United States also on the board of Qantas Services, which is the uh, largest utility construction firm building telecom, natural gas, and importantly, uh, power lines. We are a joint venture operator with the Canadian utility of the uh, Puerto Rico uh, grid. That handover will happen this summer. So I get to talk about resilience. Uh, the people in the, the system of uh, Puerto Rico are a full hearing in a full case of their own. Um, today, I'm. CEO of the Hunt Energy Network. We're building storage batteries, small batteries at the distribution level around the state of Texas. Uh, I think the role of energy storage in the future is going to be one that uh, will be just nowhere to go but up. Uh, as we bring on intermittent resources, I understand the members' concerns and, and live through them as well. Uh, with uh, intermittent resources, our variable resources, that we've got to do something to firm those up. Storage is that golden bullet that as a regulator I didn't have 15, 20 years ago when we were talking through market issues across from California to New England. But storage is uh, just beginning. It's got to scale up, but it's a pretty interesting place to be. So I don't speak for any of those companies, but yet I'm informed by my experience with all of them. And um, I do think that uh, the years that have happened, uh, and particularly these last three or four across the country. I personally lived through um, a drought, uh, two hurricane hits in Houston, uh, this weather event in Texas last week, the President's, or last month, the President's Day freeze that went to all 254 counties of the state with a winter weather warning, which we've never, ever had statewide. Uh, it tells me the world is changing. And the modeling that we have done cannot just look in the rearview mirror and say how we're going to avoid the next pothole that we just ran through, but has to be much more creative and much more imaginative about the world that we see coming. Um, it's, it is the role of government, even for a right of center people like me, it is the role of government to help marshal those resources and pull the right people and the right visions together so that we do think about infrastructure in a new way. Um, one of those ways that uh, certainly came up was uh, the events in my home state uh, last month. I, um, I think at the end of the day, our legislature is deeply involved in that review t as, as we speak. In fact, ERCOT is in fact testifying today as is my successor as chairman of the Public Utility Commission, uh, working through the financial issues. But the operational issues, which uh, Mr. Rod and the NERC and the FERC will review under their mandate, will probably include familiar ones as well as some new ones. The failure of power plants to perform, which I think in my figure three of my testimony might be a good place to look, that it really was across all energy resources. Some did better than others, but all were in, in fact impacted below what we had expected them to be. Failures in the natural gas system, which feeds about half of our power in Texas, failures on that system to perform. The interplay between the two, which was pointed out in the NERC's 2011 report, continues to be a large issue. Commercial issues, market rule implementations, again, scenario planning. The public communication issues were uh, uh, big issues for our legislature last month, that the, the lack of uh, we know more about uh, when Amber's, uh, Amber Alerts go out about somebody that got uh, kidnapped in the state of Texas than we knew about a shellacking that was coming that would affect four and a half million people. So that was a significant impact. And then finally, the one that was most customer impacting was the management of the outages by our local utilities. That was a significant 
uh, shortfall that uh, is being remedied as we speak because uh, could happen again as soon as this summer. So we always have to be ready. We have to be vigilant. But most of all, we have to be creative. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Now we're going to have Mr. Michael Schellenberger, founder and president of Environmental Progress. Thank you and good morning, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee. I'm grateful to the committee for inviting my testimony. In its 2017 report, the National Academies of Science warned that our electricity grids were becoming increasingly complex and vulnerable due to restructured energy markets and the increased use of variable energy sources. While all energy sources failed to perform as anticipated in mid-February, some perform better than others. The capacity factors for nuclear, natural gas, coal, and wind in Texas during the four days of load shedding were 79%, 55%, 58%, and 14% respectively. Experts today agree that weather-dependent energy sources over the last decade have made the grid more sensitive to extreme weather. Last August, California's grid operator attributed on a conference call the lack of energy supply to the state's closure of nuclear and natural gas plants and its overestimation of what renewables could contribute. California's share of non-hydro renewables increased from 14 to 39 percent of electricity from 2011 to 2020. The impacts on affordability were serious. Our cost of electricity rose eight times more than the rest of the United States. And today, Californians pay 50 percent, over 50 percent more than the national average. Economists at the University of Chicago found that electricity customers in 29 states had paid $125 billion more on electricity than they would have in the absence of renewable energy mandates. What makes electricity reliable, resilient, and affordable is the generation by a few large efficient plants with the minimal necessary wires and storage. I think this is the most important conclusion. The basic picture is that a simpler grid is a more reliable, resilient, and affordable creates more reliable, resilient, and affordable electricity. Industrial solar and wind projects require between three to 400 times more land than nuclear plants or natural gas plants. And the best available science calculates that if the US were to try to generate all of its energy with renewables, we would need to increase the amount of land required for energy from 0.5% to 25 or even 50%. Opposition to significantly expanding transmission comes from communities and conservationists across the US. For example, a federal judge last year blocked a transmission line at the behest of plaintiffs proposed to be built straight through a whooping crane habitat in Nebraska because transmission lines are the number one cause of mortality among whooping cranes. Most of today's storage lasts for minutes not, or hours, not months or seasons. We see the impact of this in Germany in January and February of this year. Germany's renewables produced just two thirds of the electricity they produced in January and February of last year despite a 4% increase in solar panel and wind turbine capacity, simply because of annual variability of wind and sun. Germany has only been able to manage the seasonal fluctuations from intermittent renewables by maintaining diverse fleet of coal, natural gas, and nuclear power plants, and at a very high cost. France today spends just over half as much per kilowatt of electricity that produces one-tenth of the carbon emissions of German electricity and that's because, new, because France's grid is preponderantly nuclear, whereas Germany is phasing out nuclear. The most influential proposal for 100% renewable energy in the United States relies upon a tenfold increase in the power of existing hydroelectric dams in the United States, but the real potential of pumped hydroelectric storage, according to the Department of Energy, is just 1% of that. California has a major network of dams, but we haven't converted them into batteries because you need just the right kind of dams and reservoirs. It's a very expensive retrofit, and we need the water for our farms and cities. As a result, California has had to curtail electricity coming from our solar farms and pay Arizona to take excess electricity during sunny days. The US has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions between 2011 and 2020 more than any other nation in history. But now emissions, prices, and resiliency risk rising if the U.S. closes the nuclear reactors in California, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, New York, and Pennsylvania that prevented wider powder, power outages over the last three years. Although Texas lost one of its four nuclear reactors after cold water affected a sensor, automatically shutting down a reactor, it returned to service within 36 hours, helping to end the power cuts. 
Meanwhile, nuclear reactors in other cold snap states operated normally. The Senate can play a constructive role by taking action now to prevent the closure of these nuclear plants, which have proven essential to maintaining a diversity, reliability, and affordability of supply, as well as, I might add, the sustainability of our energy mix. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Schellenberger. And now we have Mr. Manu Astana, President and CEO of the PJM Interconnection. Mr. Thank Astana. You. Good morning, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, members of the committee. My name is Manu Astana, and I'm the CEO of PJM Interconnection. On behalf of PJM, it's a pleasure to be here with you today and participate in this hearing uh, and share my perspectives on reliability, resilience, affordability uh, of the bulk power grid. PJM is a grid operator. We're based in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, and our organization was formed in 1927. We have grown over time to now serve 65 million people who live in 13 states and the District of Columbia. We serve uh, one fifth of the nation's population. I wanted to start today just by saying that the reliability of the bulk power system is our organization's driving purpose. Uh, watching the human impact of the recent events in Texas has been a sobering reminder uh, of the importance of that purpose. I can tell you that I personally feel the weight of the responsibility that we as PJM and our members have to keep the power flowing every day. I wanted to really cover four points in my opening remarks today. Uh, the first point is that the PJM grid is strong <clears throat> and it has performed well including during the recent winter storm where we uh, were able to keep the power flowing and actually export records amount of electricity to support our neighbors in their time of need. The second point I wanted to make today was that resilience is critical and it takes deliberate effort. We at PJM regularly think about what could go wrong, but there are going to be things that happen that we didn't anticipate. The COVID pandemic is a good example. PJM has had a pandemic plan since 2006, yet so much about this event has been unexpected. We've had to learn, we've had to adapt. We've taken significant steps to preserve our ability to control the grid, including building a third control room and having teams of operators live on site for up to 10 weeks in some cases, just so that we have a backup plan to our backup plan. Our pandemic response is one demonstration of how seriously we take resilience. The third point I wanted to share with you today is notwithstanding the first two points, there is more work to be done, both on reliability and on resilience. We at PGM have studied and responded to extreme events, including the 2011 uh, Southwest blackouts, as well as a 2014 polar vortex that hit our system. And while we don't have all the facts yet about the recent ERCOT event, there are at least three questions we believe that we and our stakeholders and our regulators must address in our own backyard. The first question is, while our approach to winterization has shown dividends, it is an incentive-based approach. And we're asking if we need to implement more binding winterization standards and other specific resilient standards for high impact, low probability events, whether those events are caused by climate change or otherwise. The second question we're asking is whether we need to add circuit breakers to scarcity pricing for power as well as for gas during extended periods of shortage or natural disasters. And fi the final question we're asking is what additional planning and coordination is needed to ensure that inputs to power generation like natural gas are protected during load shed events? I'm sure there are gonna be more questions, but those are the ones that are on our mind at the moment. Finally, the fourth point I wanted to share with you today is that the development of renewable generation on PJM's grid is accelerating, and we are committed to ensuring grid reliability through this transition. Today, PJM has over 145,000 megawatts of generation in our interconnection fleet. Of this, 92% is wind, solar, battery, or a hybrid of these technologies. And renewables, while they're intermittent, certainly can carry a portion of the grid's reliability needs. We saw that during the winter storm. I'm happy to share some of that data later. However, we must ensure that our markets support an adequate supply of dispatchable backup generation well into the future if we're going to keep our grid reliable. We are currently engaged with our stakeholders on this very subject. 
Thank you for your focus on these important issues. I look forward to your questions. Thank you to all of you. Thank you so much. And I'll start the questioning now. Uh, to Mr. Wood, you have a very unique perspective having first been chairman of the Texas Public Utility Commission and then chairman of FERC. There's been a lot of discussion and blame cast on Texas for the way the grid was designed to be self-contained, seemingly to avoid federal oversight of the energy market and how the inability to import power that made the situation worse last month. My question would be, you've been on both sides of this, so what's so bad about FERC oversight? That's true. I have been. I've, I've <laughs> carried both sides of the uh, of the river, I, I, and I've, I've, I have tried to be the the voice of calm to both sides. Of it's not so bad on the other team. Um, there are some unique attributes of Texas that, uh, and, and the, particularly in the power market, that when I went from that role to the one at FERC, uh, I would have lost, and 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 actually, and I didn't would have lost. I didn't have, for example. As we were setting up our power market in Texas, we ordered the utilities to become part of the RTO, become the equivalent of PJM up here. Utilities still have that option to pull in and out and use that power, I think, sometime uh, not in a great way to, to undermine the market. And I would love to, for that not to have been an issue. At and I think my question would be this. Since you have seen both up post, close and personal, uh, what is the objection? What is FERC overreaching, federal overreaching that causes uh, higher prices or less competitiveness? Or what is what would be the objection that Texas does not want to be involved? I think the, the issue that, that mattered the most to me was the ability to have a single regulator over the retail and the wholesale market. We had the ability to, to put that vision in place that Governor Bush and the bipartisan legislature said they wanted for both wholesale competition and four years later for a retail competitive market, and the ability to, to see that vision through. Um, we, we, we were able to plan our transmission grid and pay for it in a simple way. We were able to interconnect our generation plants in a straightforward and simple way. So we didn't have to negotiate that with other states or negotiate that with the federal government. It just was a, 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 an easier thing to do. Sure. It just, but it was, I, you know, I wish for that for the whole nation, that we had that kind of unified vision um, we've got to look for the Congress for that, and uh, I know it's been hard to get over a past generation. Mr. Astana, uh, as you know, my home state of West Virginia is in PJM service territory. 100,000 of my constituents were without power last month as a result of the winter storm, but it was a different story from what we saw in Texas. In West Virginia, it was because of down power lines and poles for the most part. You mentioned in your written testimony some of the lessons learned from the 2014 polar vortex that impacted West Virginia and surrounding states. Do you believe that lessons learned from 2014 were implemented in a way that lessened the potential impact of the winter storm last month because a lot of West Virginians do not? Uh, so what are some of your early lessons learned from last month that you would prevent in the next time? Yes, Senator Manchin, uh, thank you for the question. And West Virginia is a very important part of PJM. I do believe that the lessons from 2011 as well as 2014 were learned and were implemented, and I'll point to three. We implemented uh, winterization checklists and reporting back to us for our generators. Uh, we implemented underperformance penalties for generators who didn't show up with their commitments. Um, and we uh, implemented much more stringent gas to power coordination. And as a result, we saw in 2014 forced outages of 22%. We lost 22% of our fleet. Um, last month, we, that number was less than 10%. So there, there have been significant improvements uh, since 2014 directly as a, as a result of the lessons learned um, there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rob, and then Mr. Wood can finish up on this if he would like to jump in. But Mr. Rob, this is directly to you. ERCOT is designed to have a minimal backup generation and a high price cap that is intended to incentivize generators, ge uh, generators to be available when needed. Several of the country's grid operators operate a capacity market to pay generators to make more power plants available years into the future, like PJM, for example. These are two approaches to balancing reliability and affordability. Can you shed some light on whether ERCOT's high price cap approach, where power prices shot up to a $9,000 $9, per megawatt hour for days worked? The bills consumers are receiving sound like price gouging to me. Uh, is a high price cap a reasonable way to incentivize 
generators to be ready? Senator Manchin, I appreciate that question. Uh, I'm not a market design expert, so I can't really comment on whether the price cap was appropriate or not. I, I think in any way, shape that you look at it, though, uh, it did not adequately incent generation to be online during this past event. Well, based on recent events, what do you think is the best way to line up sufficient capacity to come online when needed so we don't run into this lack of ability? It either needs to be rewarded through a market mechanism, such as a, 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 a capacity market or a very high price opportunity, as they've elected to do in Texas, or administratively determined through a regulatory proceeding at, at a state commission. So, Mr. Estana, you have a much lower price cap coupled with a capacity market. Can you explain why PGM took that approach and what the trade-offs are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we took that approach because we, we have a multi-state jurisdiction that we serve, and we wanted to make sure that we had capacity available three years into the future. And the three-year figure is, is selected because that's roughly the amount of time it, it took to build a CT um, and that would have made up that capacity. I do want to say, though, that I think the underlying explanation is, is more complex. It's, I think it's, it's easy to think, oh, if only Texas had a capacity market, this wouldn't have happened. I think Texas would have had a higher reserve margin, perhaps. But it's important to note that going into this winter, Texas had reported a reserve margin for this winter of 43%. And so it was not a shortage of capacity. It was this incredibly cold weather for which the capacity was not prepared. And, uh, you know, and we think that could happen to us. We have prepared a lot, but we're very focused on making sure that we are um, uh, continue to be prepared. Thank you very much. Senator Barrasso. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Gabriel, you know, you're the administrator, the CEO of the Western Area Power Administration, and in that role, uh, the territory that you serve includes California, as well as parts of Texas and other states affected by the cold weather we had last month. So I have a series of very short questions for you. Uh, do you agree that we should produce electricity from a diverse set of energy resources, including resources that are capable of producing electricity at all times of day and night? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. And would the blackouts that we witnessed in California last August, would they have been avoided if California had simply installed more solar panels? Um, I do not believe that that would be the case. Of course, okay. you need a diversity of generating resources, Senator. So with, with the blackouts that we witnessed in Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas last month, would they have been avoided if these states had simply installed, say, more wind turbines? Uh, again, I think a diverse portfolio is required to keep all of these grids operating. It's, okay. it's really one of the foundational concepts uh, for the grids in the United States. Would the impact of the blackouts that we witnessed in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, and elsewhere last month have been worse if, if no one had access to natural gas and everyone had to rely on electricity to heat their homes? Well, again, uh, not operating the grid in Texas, but certainly making sure that we've got diverse portfolios, which at, certainly in this day and age need to include natural gas. And, and with the impact of the, black, the blackouts that we witnessed in California in 2019 and 20 and across the middle of the country last month, would they have been even worse if everyone, including emergency responders, had to rely exclusively on electricity to power their vehicles? Well, again, we've got to make sure that we've got sufficient supply and sufficient generation, whether it's vehicles, whether it's uh, powering homes or businesses. It's crucial to have a real diverse portfolio. Uh, Mr. Schellenberger, first, thanks for making the trip coming here all the way from Berkeley, California. Um, you know, you've written, and you say, quote, California's big bet on renewables and shunning of natural gas and nuclear is directly responsible for the state's blackouts and high electricity prices. Could, could you expand upon your comments for the committee? Well, sure. Um, there was a root cause analysis uh, published by the California Public Utilities Commission, the California Energy Commission, and the California grid operator, CAISO, uh, which made a very similar point, though in a more muted fashion. Um, that point was made very dramatically in the midst of the crisis last August in a conference call with reporters where the grid operator specifically pointed to the closure of San Onofre nuclear power plant, um, which was about 2,200 megawatts of power, as well as the closure of natural gas plants as the really the main factors that resulted in the shortage of energy. You, you know, you've written a bit, and you said, uh, quote, uh, have, some have long pointed to batteries as the way to integrate unreliable renewables onto the grid. However, batteries, you say, are simply 
not up to the task today. And you went on to explain, indeed, for renewables to work, batteries would need to be able to store the power for weeks and perhaps even months. Can you expand upon the comments for the committee? Sure. Well, we have one of the largest uh, battery installations in the world in Escondido, California, and it provides power for 16,000 Californians for about four hours. There's almost 40 million Californians. Um, the cost is prohibit prohibitively high, and in fact, most um, advocates of renewables now no longer think that uh, lithium batteries are going to be a, an, an important form of storage beyond uh, you know, managing minutes or hours. But as I pointed out, the reason that Germany was able to prevent similar power outages um, this year was simply that they maintain a very large coal, natural gas, and nuclear fleet um, to be available when the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing. Thanks, Mr. Schellenberger. M Mr. Robb, if I could ask you, you in your test written testimony, you made the following observation. You said, over the years, uh, NERC's assessments have continued to identify three areas of primary concern, California, Texas, and New England. Um, while recent events in the, in the central, south, and western parts of the country have attracted national attention, uh, New England is another reason, a region that you have said has identified as particularly vulnerable to extreme cold weather. You, you noted that New England's problems include its limited pipeline capacity to import gas and its dependence on a handful of critical fuel assets. So in light of the problems, should, should we discourage the construction of new natural gas pipelines or retire power plants that are capable of producing electricity at, at all times? Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Senator Barrasso. And uh, we strongly believe that more natural gas infrastructure and gas, natural gas uh, infrastructure, including storage, pipeline capacity, uh, needs to be a, uh, a strong uh, policy focus. Uh, New England desperately needs more, uh, more gas capacity to be resilient to the winter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, finally, I have an article that was in uh, Green Tech Media from uh, last August uh, titled, California's Shift from Natural Gas to Solar is Playing a Role in the Rolling Blackouts. The article quotes the CEO of the California grid operator as saying, the situation we are in could have been avoided. The article goes on to say that the California grid operator has told California regulators for years that there is inadequate power available during the hours when the solar generation has left the system. I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, that we include this article in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have next Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for holding this important hearing. Uh, I'm definitely for a smarter, cleaner, more secure, more resilient grid. I personally think that that takes um, a level of investment. We've had a couple of big studies recently talk about there was an MIT study and then a University of California study that investing $100 billion in transmission expansion uh, could achieve uh, a higher, cleaner grid and help reduce wholesale costs. So I was wondering if I could get you gentlemen to give me uh, an assessment of whether you think modernization of our grid uh, is an investment we should be seeking. Um, and do you think that the private sector will make those investments, or are we talking about some federal cost share here? And do you think that that is in the tens of billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars? How would you characterize the modernization and the investment that we need to make? And if you could just go quickly, that'd be great. Jim, you want to go first? So I'm asking you, do you believe we need that investment? At what level, and what's the mix? I'll jump a in. A mix of federal and private investment. <laughs> I'll jump in, Senator Cantwell, and it's a, it's a great question. We do need the backbone. If, if there are any, any part of the, the vision from the president and from many in the industry, is gonna enable, we're going to need it to be enabled by a substantially stouter transmission grid that will move the resources from where they are to where the people are. And I think that's probably a nine-figure number. Um, it's, it's a lot of money. But it's over time, and it's quite frankly, as we learned in Texas, when you spend money on transmission, you save a lot more than you spend on getting uh, low-cost power into your power system. 
So I'll, I'll go next. Um, you know, this country has uh, remarkable natural resources uh, all around the uh, all around the country. They're not always near where people live, uh, where the power needs to go. And a, uh, the, this concept of a national uh, transmission grid is uh, something that's very worthy of, uh, of consideration. We've not studied the reliability impacts of it, other than uh, to note that diversity is reliability's friend. So that's a uh, that's a good thing. I would probably concur with your assessment as to the cost of it. I think the gating factor, though, that I think this committee needs to be aware of is that it's probably not the need for transmission or the uh, desire to fund transmission, but the ability to cite transmission that is the biggest obstacle to the development of that system. Well, certainly. Yeah, and I, I'm uh, happy to comment as well, Senator. Look, I think the industry has done a pretty good job investing in what I'll describe as traditional trans transmission. I think what we also have to look at and understand is how can we use the existing transmission system differently? For example, there are seven ties between the Eastern and Western grid that are perfect examples of 1980s technology, which could clearly be upgraded and quite frankly could be done within a two to four year time frame. So we'd have some immediate benefit there. I also think that in addition to obviously permitting takes time and funding is important, but right now there's a bit of of a, uh, a challenge with getting people to agree to the offtake. Transmission construction requires long-term offtake agreements. The agreements are, folks are hesitant to get into that. So if something can be done clearly to uh, incent folks to agree to take the power, that would really, I believe, free up the entire situation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna skip Mr. Gabriel because I actually think I know what he thinks, but I mean, just being the Western power grid, I kind of think I know what you've been up to. Um, I just want to point out, though, that Texas, uh, I understand that 96% of its projects in the ERCOT pipeline are either wind or solar. So I, I, you know, with Texas being an ultimate free market, I mean, it tells me something that people are going after that. But I would like to talk about where did the money go in Texas? Mr. Wood, it's uh, good to see you again. Obviously, you and I talked a lot about the Western energy crisis and where the money went in that situation. But um, I want to understand, because according to watchdog firms, Texas power markets overcharged energy users $16 billion. That left prices at 9000 per megawatt uh, hour grid emergency standard for longer than necessary. Are you familiar with this analysis, and do you agree with those conclusions? I am familiar with the analysis. I think that the uh, the conclusions quantified it as if every me uh, megawatt hour had been sold at 9,000. Of course, 90% of the business in Texas is done bilaterally by contract. So I think a number of customers were exempt from that. But do you think, that well, that's what, that, I'm, that's what I'm actually worried about, like yeah. that the consumer here, um, just like in the Western energy market. So do you think uh, consumers should be reimbursed? Uh, that issue, the, the legislature is hearing, is having a hearing on it today. Were I in that seat, I would have uh, agreed with the independent market monitor. Do you think that there are, do you know of any Enron traders who were involved in both the Texas and California markets that are employed at ERCOT trading now? I will have to check. I'm not aware of any. Well, look, I think, Mr. Chairman, I think, we, I think we've seen what happened here, at least in the detail. I'm not talking about the crisis itself, but in the aftermath. And I think we just need better tools to protect consumers and businesses from these kinds of spikes in rate. Mr. Wood knows that I've fought diligently against our state having to pay 3,000 times the rate in long-term contracts that were fraudulently manipulated. So we passed laws here to try to protect people. I think we, Mr. Chairman, you said it best, price gouging should not be tolerated in these kinds of emergencies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Now we have Senator Daines. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. According to recent reports, the Pacific Northwest including Montana, will face a shortage of power supplies to meet peak load conditions. This means that while Montana and the Northwest can currently meet day-to-day -day demand, there's a real threat that during peak conditions we could face the same issues that we've seen in places like California, Texas, and others most recently. It's my understanding that Montana electricity distributors are worried about generation resources to meet peak demand. And the problem will only get worse if we continue to shut down coal, and other base load and flexible generation across the region. Um, I, I respect Senator Heinrich's comments earlier about him in Texas. I can tell you in Montana, it wasn't because of natural gas freezing up. Uh, we're used to cold weather, and without the base load of coal, we would have had some um, serious issues here uh, last winter. 
and uh, even during the summer months of last year. While in Montana, we have a great balance with hydro and coal providing baseload, a growing wind generation as well across the state, if the Biden administration moves blindly, which we're seeing them doing today, to shut down all fossil fuel generation, that balance will be threatened and reliability concern turns into a stark reality. Mr. Schellenberger, how does a rapid move away from traditional base load and flexible power sources without new equally flexible and stable generation affect the reliability of the grid? Oh, thank you, Senator. I think it's a really important question. I think it also relates to the, the former question by uh, Senator Cantwell, which is that if you're building additional transmission, the assumption would be that you're bringing power from somewhere else, but if wind is already low during the cold snap and you build more transmission to more wind turbines, it's not going to increase, it's not going to do much for you. Similarly, in California, since peak demand was occurring when the sun was going down, more transmission lines from solar plants isn't going to help us. So there's really no substitute for having baseload power. Um, if we lose those baseload plants, we're just going to see more and more episodes like the ones that we saw uh, last month and also in California last summer. So, Ms. Schellenberger, with Montana and regional baseload and flexible generation sources declining, it's creating a scarcity of resources to meet peak demand, as you articulated. If we, as we've seen recently, what happens regionally can also affect Montana communities. So the need for balance can't just be focused on any one state, certainly by the nature of the, of the interconnectivity of the grid. What steps can we take to ensure balance? I think that's a really key word right now. It's, it's missing in this dialogue in Washington, D.C., is balance and reliability throughout multi-state markets. Well, yeah, you're raising the right concern, I think, and I, it's, it's obviously up to the senators to understand how these issues relate to both state and local. But what I would point out is that this rising complexity itself poses a significant problem. I mean, in all three of the National Academies of Sciences reports from 2012, 2017, and just recently last month, they pointed to complexity overwhelming the regulators. And I have to say that when I read um, the other witnesses' statements, I was struck by that the solution to the complexity is to add more complexity to the system, and that starts to become troubling, I think, when you have a system that nobody seems to completely understand and have problems emerge uh, really counter to what experts had been predicting. Question for Mr. Gabriel. There have been recent calls to breach hydropower dams in the Columbia Snake River system. As you know, having spent years at WAPA, hydropower provides strong baseload power for western Montana and much of the Pacific Northwest. My question is, how would a move to breach dams affect the supply of flexible baseload energy in the region? And by the way, zero carbon emissions as well. Uh, thank you, Senator. Obviously, we are uh, not wildly in support of breaching dams for all the reasons you said, in addition to things like black start capability, resilience, and reliability. We've got to consider in the United States, only 3% of the 90,000 dams have power capabilities to them. And if anything, I think it's a, it's a valuable discussion to have to make sure that we are thinking about increasing hydropower as it is a carbon-free resource and one that can help bolster a grid in times of great stress. Thank you. I remember I was just struck when I came to Congress, hydro was not classified as a renewable source of energy. Uh, that was the political incorrectness here in Washington, D.C., and we finally got that changed. But it's zero carbon emissions. It's about as renewable as you can get as we watch what happens in places like Montana, a headwater state. But thank you for that answer. And Mr. Schellenberger, back to you. Instead of moving to shut down coal and natural gas plants to meet carbon goals, we should be focusing on innovation and working to expand the carbon capture technology that we've been talking about here in the committee throughout the United States. The question is, how can we use CCUS technology to keep and grow jobs in rural Montana while at the same time protecting baseload power and ensuring a reliable grid? Well, thank you, Senator. I think it's, it's, I mean, this is clearly an, an issue that matters to the Senate. It should matter to the Senate. Um, we've, we've built these carbon capture and storage demonstration projects, and then we become frustrated when they don't work out right away. Um, I, I think we need to have more patience than that, uh, certainly in the case of carbon capture and storage, also in the case of nuclear. Uh, too often, I think we, we build these projects, and then we're disappointed when they don't come to fruition. And I would just add to that, I think when we're thinking about um, our nuclear plants, because it is such an important technology for national security, we also need to be, uh, I think, considering federal action to protect those plants, which are currently not being valued for their contribution to reliability and resiliency and affordability uh, in different uh, restructured energy markets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. And now we have Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've heard some interesting 
things here today. One is that coal is base load generation. And, and I say that because the average capacity factor for coal generation in the U.S. now sits well before, below 50 percent. So the average offshore wind capacity factor is higher in Europe than the U.S. coal capacity factor. And, and we have to recognize that part of that is because coal has become completely unaffordable as a power source. Uh, if you look at Lazard or any of the independent analysis of what uh, wholesale costs are for various different generations, and you have solar at three to four cents a kilowatt and wind at three to five cents a kilowatt, and then you have coal at seven to 16 cents a kilowatt, or nuclear at 13 to 20 cents a kilowatt, you understand what some of the market pressures are here and, uh, and why we're being asked, for example, to subsidize uh, nuclear power. So moving from that to, to what we went through, and Mr. Wood, I want to start with you, and I'll, I'll, I'll begin just by thanking you for the work that you did to clean up the mess that Enron gave us. I think the work that you did on the FERC was incredibly important. But I'd ask what policies you think would be wise to accelerate the deployment of the storage that you mentioned on the grid, both in Texas and nationally. Well, I think getting a diversity of supply chain. Uh, we clearly are dependent on China and um, a few other countries in East Asia for the current technologies that I think Mr. Schellenberger pointed out correctly that there are a lot of things other than lithium ions, but those are what are in all the EVs and, the, and uh, certainly all the storage technology. So the cost upstream, if there could be some, you know, American or at least North American European supplies to that. The policies in the U.S. Uh, make it easy, make it as easy to interconnect a battery as we've made it to connect gas plants and windmills. Yeah. Um, we're, of course, version 1.0 talking with our utilities. We haven't done it before, but it's, it's not easy um, learning to get these things done one by one. I think the market policies in most of the organized markets are very friendly to batteries, so I think we've got that box checked. So interconnection is really a big Interconnection challenge. is important. Um, I'm going to skip over the, uh, the pricing issue, which seems to be an enormously important thing if that $16 billion figure is accurate. But jumping forward a little bit, I think it's pretty, pretty obvious that one of the, the challenges is, and I, I want to put aside for just a moment, Mr. Wood, the, the desire uh, by by Texas not or by ERCOT not to have direct FERC oversight, but would it have been helpful for Texas to be able to import power either from the east or the west in this recent episode? Because I noticed that El Paso power, for example, El Paso didn't have the same uh, rolling blackouts because they were able to pull from the western grid. And they're directly interconnected with it. We do have right. some uh, gates in the wall. Uh, you, have, the, you have DC connections, but yes, you don't have direct connections. Correct. That's right. And uh, there actually are uh, proposals to put more of the DC ties in both east and west. To be honest, a few gigawatts wouldn't have helped, wouldn't have hurt, but it wouldn't have saved us from really what was a 20 gigawatt shortfall. shortfall. Uh, at the uh, What was the single largest uh, shortfall from which generation source? If you look at well, our largest supplier on a normal day is gas. So the impact of gas dropping uh, both at the supply level and then at the power plant level, and that's that's the interesting thing to figure out is how much was related to lack of winterization, which we should have learned from the 2011 experience. How much was done from that, and how much actually had to do with the supply system or the upstream issues from the gas uh, wells all the way yeah. down to the power plant. Right. So for Mr. Uh, Astana at PJM. I'm curious, you know, we've talked about the need for increased uh, transmission, but there are also technologies like uh, power flow control that can help us uh, use the existing transmission much more effectively. Dynamic line rating, storage is transmission, topology optimization. And while other countries have started to really utilize those things in order to uh, oftentimes make an electron take the longer way around so we can better effectively use our existing grid. We haven't done a lot of that in the U.S. What, what role could those play in the future? Yeah, Senator Heinrich, I think that 
those are that's a great question at pgm we're um, involved in almost all of those technologies either in implementation or in piloting so with dynamic line readings uh, you talk about carbon core conductors storage as a transmission asset uh, we're adding synchrophasers to our system uh, with the help of a doe grant and the purpose of all of this is to squeeze more capacity out of an existing transmission system because it's hard to cite new transmission uh, while increasing reliability. So uh, you're going to see those technologies on our system. Uh, you're seeing them already, but you'll see them in larger deployment very soon. Uh, just one more point, if I could quickly make about your earlier question about coal. Um, you know, in this recent coal snap in PJM, coal was about 32% of the generation. Gas was about 32% of the generation. Nuclear was 26% of the generation. And so just from a fuel diversity perspective, as a grid operator, I do think as we go through this transition, it's really important to make sure that we can hold on to those dispatchable resources until we have something to fill the gap, whether that something is batteries or something else. Thank you, Chairman. I apologize for running over. Thank you, Senator. Uh, now we have Senator Hoven. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. I recently asked uh, former Secretary of Energy Dan Vallette to give me his thoughts in regard to the importance of baseload energy, particularly as we saw uh, the weather event last month and its impact across the country, particularly in uh, Texas. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit that letter for the record. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, and I just read a couple ex excerpts from it. First, uh, the Department of Energy's National Energy Technology Lab conducted an exhaustive study following the polar vortex in 2014 and the bomb cyclone of 2018 and found that in each instance, the generation used most reliably to meet the increase in demand due to those weather conditions was produced by nuclear, coal, oil, and natural gas. And quote, these reports illustrate the importance of maintaining generation from sources at risk of closure. One other excerpt, the current market construct of the various grid operators, quote, fails to recognize the value of baseload electricity generation. And that's why these markets should be better, quote, designed to adequately price reliability and resiliency in addition to capacity and the cost of energy. So, quote, power is available to all when it is needed most. Again, that's from the letter uh, from former uh, Secretary Dan Bullett, which I just introduced him to the record. I, I'd like to thank him. Uh, for that uh, uh, response and his letter. Uh, Mr. Rob, do you agree that baseload coal and nuclear are essential to grid reliability during extreme weather events? So we don't have authority over resource selection and fuel type. We try to make sure that our work is fuel agnostic. Um, however, diversity of resource has been brought up many times is a great thing for reliability. And I think until there's an alternative, uh, those resources are going to continue to play an important role in the uh, reliability and security of our electric grid. Yeah. Uh, and how do we incentivize that? How do we make sure that we have that fuel diversity to give us that stability? Uh, Oh, on the grid. Well, again, I think that's up to uh, uh, local state policy uh, that affects resource selection and or market incentives in uh, market competitive states to ensure that those characteristics are appropriately rewarded. And uh, the technology continues to be developed to provide alternatives uh, and or to make those uh, uh, resources more compatible with the uh, energy vision we have as a country. What is NERC doing to make sure that the regional transmission operators, RTOs, ensure we retain the base load generated and the fuel mix, as we're talking about, needed during uh, weather events uh, so that we have the reliability that we need uh, as well as affordability uh, on the grid at all times? So, so we do not get involved in market rule determination or uh, uh, some of the questions that you uh, raised there. However, all of the market operators are subject to our reliability standards, which are mandatory and enforceable, uh, that require them to produce contingency plans for all sorts of um, unanticipated events and be prepared to, uh, to take appropriate action to preserve reliability of the system. Mr. Estama, you uh, referenced the importance of the fuel diversity mix, including baseball, for reliability, reliability of the grid at all times, and particularly during extreme weather events, correct? 
trade center of an although just with one minor edit uh, i would say coal is no longer base load on our system it has a capacity factor of 36 percent. so the only traditional base load resource we have is nuclear which runs 95 percent of the time uh, but i think your point is is spot on which is we do need uh, a diversity of resources Mr. Wood, do you agree that uh, general, generational assets that can provide electricity in all weather events, hot, cold, windy, calm, et cetera, should be fairly compensated for their reliability? I absolutely do. Okay. And then uh, how can we better ensure that we maintain that mix and properly incentivize them so that we have them in adequate proportion to the intermittent sources as well? I think that's uh, I think that's the challenge, and that that means we've got to specify that firmness uh, and dispatchability is a resource that we're willing to pay for. Um, different markets can do that in different ways, but uh, at the end of the day, I'm certainly one who sat in the dark for a few days last month. I can vouch for the fact that I want every uh, kilowatt, regardless of how it's generated to be on the grid on these stress days. And if we aren't paying enough to make that happen, uh, we've got to figure out how to do it. And if we don't, then we'll repeat what happened last month with that extreme weather event, correct? We will, and, and certainly weatherization issues are an important part of making the existing facilities we have. I'm not willing to give up that we don't have a good portfolio. I do think Texas had 100 gigawatts of nameplate capacity, but uh, it didn't show up when we needed it. And so the operational aspects of it are important too, Senator. And I want to make sure that we cover really both. Right, very much so. Thank you so much for your, all of you, for your response. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Hovind. Senator Rono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank all the panelists. Mr. Robb, according to the Associated Press, about 80 people died as a result of the winter storms last month. And as you described in your testimony, after a winter storm in 2011 caused power outages and reduced gas production in Texas and neighboring states, NERC and FERC issued recommendations to state regulators to weatherize their power and gas systems. Were those recommendations followed by regulators and elected officials in Texas? So we will know the answer to that when we complete our inquiry into this uh... Uh, into this most recent event. The, uh, the recommendations that were put in that report were not uh, subject to audit and uh, compliance monitoring uh, from, from our agency. So I really don't know the answer as to what uh, actions were actually taken, uh, but we'll find out as we work through our inquiry. Well, considering the massiveness of the, the uh, failure in Texas, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, they probably didn't follow your recommendations. Uh, very well. So in, in September 2019, NERC initiated development of new cold weather requirements through enhancements to existing mandatory reliability standards, standards which your testimony states will be submitted for approval to NERC's Board of Trustees in June. How do you think adoption of those mandatory standards would have affected the response to this February storm? Uh, th there's no doubt that they would have helped. Uh, I think one of the things that we don't know yet know that we, again, we will uncover through this inquiry is whether if the power plants were weatherized adequately for the conditions that were in place, whether the fuel system, uh, basically the natural gas system in Texas, would have been able to deliver uh, fuel to those plants. That's a major open, open issue and one that we want to get to the bottom of. Well, considering that we have this kind of uh a massive power outage in 2011 and now in 2021. Do you expect these kinds of weather conditions to be recurring? And we need to make sure that we plan for them because to have literally hundreds of thousands of people without power for days on end is simply unacceptable. Yeah, there's no question in my mind that the electric system and the natural gas system need to start planning for more extreme weather events as more routine, uh, more routine occurrences, yeah. as opposed to treating these events as, you know, one off high impact, low frequency events. They're happening far too frequently. So just a yes or no, do the other panelists agree that we need to, these are conditions that are going to occur uh, more frequently and they're not just once in a uh, thousand year occurrences? Anybody disagree with that kind of assessment? 
Senator, I do not. As I said in my opening statement, the impact on four and a half million people is uh, pretty arresting, and it's not anything we need to be doing every 10 years. Thank you. I, I agree as well. Okay, so I think all of our panelists agree we need to prepare, better prepare. Uh, Commissioner Wood, as you know, Hawaii has six island power grids, so we are definitely not connected to any other state, clearly, and not even to each island. And so they can't share power with uh, each other. And Hawaii has hosted mm -hmm. several DOE funded projects to evaluate how micro microgrids could, with local distributed power su supplies, help co communities maintain power for critical services while the larger electric grid is shut down due to storms or uh, possibly cyber attacks. You described in your testimony how Texas should consider creating smaller circuits to allow grid operators to conduct more uh, targeted outages in the event of another extreme weather event. Do you think there are benefits to microgrids to support critical services? And if so, what more do regulators uh, need to do to encourage their use? Um, you're right on, Senator. I, I mean, I'm doing that for my day job. We're putting small batteries at the distribution level and, and enabling those things to happen. There's a lot more technology that uh, is in, in way that's part of the, the open system we have in Texas was intended to bring that sort of innovation in. But microgrids are a big part of the future. They would have been a real asset for us mm -hmm. as they are for you in the islands for resilience purposes last month. And uh, I think the future's nowhere but up for the microgrids. I hope that in fact, Texas will follow that, that kind of uh, assessment and recommendation because you know, my understanding of Texas <coughs> is that, that basically the power there is uh, in a competitive free marketplace model. And I do think that there are some commodities such as electricity that is so basic that <coughs> the, the best system to deliver that necessary commodity. Thank you. So, I'd, I'd love to continue that debate, but I, I, <laughs> I think we're all in service of the fact that we want what's best for our customers at a good price, but we want it to stay on. <clears throat> Thank you. Senator Langford. Hey, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gabriel, let me ask a quick question. I've got several questions to be able to go through with other folks here, but I'm, I'm tracking through the Biden team that they have announced that they wanted the power sector to be 100% renewable by 2035. I would assume that's going to require some transmission lines and trying to be able to connect places that have more renewables to places that do not. Mr. Gabriel, uh, would you make that same assumption as well, that we're going to have to have increased number of transmission lines to be able to hit that kind of goal by 2035? Uh, yes, I do, and I also believe in we're going to have to upgrade some of the existing transmission system that we have. Well, I, I noticed just for what you're dealing with, we, we started pulling through what I, I love the name of this, the Trans West Express Transmission Project. I love the name Express in there, the Trans West Express tra Transmission Project. It looks like this project started in 2007 and still has not commenced construction yet at this point based on permitting, studies, right-of-ways, surveys. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. I've only been here since 2013, and I will say in 2015, I signed the record of decision uh, for the project to move forward. It was similar to the comment I made earlier. Someone's got to agree to the offtake in order for these lines to be built so that there can be uh, transmission agreements. And that's really been the hang up thus far. So th this conversation about let's just quickly do renewable power and we'll send it all over the country and get it done begs the question of how you're gonna do transmission lines for that when we've got a transmission line project that started for you in 2007 and is still not close uh, to being complete at this point. Some sometimes 2035 seems like a long way away unless you're doing capital projects and permitting and such, and it's actually not that far away nor realistic. Mr. Schellenberger, let me ask you a serious questions. You had a, a very intriguing uh, line of your statement where you talked about complexity and it being one of the challenge. What, what I heard from you basically was just because we can do that doesn't mean it's actually the right way to do it. Uh, there seems to be a lot of work on, yes, this could be done, but it makes it so incredibly complicated, drives up the cost, uh, as you talked about before. What is it more, if you were to clean the slate, as you're looking at it with your studies, what's a clean, straightforward way to be able to provide clean energy for the United States, less well, complex. Yeah, thank you, Senator. That's a great question. I, I think that there's 
um, a lot of uh, folks in the sector who are good engineers and when they're asked the question of how, whether they could do something, they answer truthfully and say yes they could, but they don't finish the, the sentence in the ways that you just did, which is that all of that additional complexity brings challenges to resiliency, affordability, and reliability. And that's just very well established in the literature that the more complex the system is, the more expensive it is. I interviewed the, uh, the lead author of the National Academies of Sciences report. You know, they were very clear about this issue. I mean, ideally you have, and we also know that um, larger plants are more efficient. So what you want is a grid with the least number of uh, power plants that you uh, need uh, and the least amount of associated wires and transmission and storage. Every time you put energy into storage and you take it back out, you're doing two energy conversions. And so you're paying a very significant penalty, even in pumped hydro, which is our currently most efficient uh, form of storage. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I just think, I think this kind of headlong pursuit into more complexity and, and more transmission and more storage, you just have to kind of ask, is that really in the best interests of the American people? It's a very interesting insight on this. Mr. Rob, I want to ask a little bit about uh, natural gas, because we've had a lot of conversation about that, whether it's working, not working, the details. It, it, it's interesting. I mean, if I look at the Southwest Power Pool uh, that I happen to live in, and I had the wonderful experience of experiencing four hours with no power uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, when it was it was kind of chilly at night. Um, so for all of us that looked at not only reliability, but resiliency of it, natural gas has been in this conversation. When I talk to folks in natural gas, uh, they'll say it, it is a unique challenge that they're getting because they're approaching a tipping point for them to say uh, natural gas is quick to be able to turn on. But when you're not asked for much for a long period of time, and then suddenly you ask for a lot in a short period of time, especially in an extremely cold weather event, uh, then suddenly it's like, you know, you know what, we can't turn it all on that fast that much. Is there a tipping point that you're seeing for providing other fuels that are out there that, for instance, we're 40, 50 60% renewables, and you've got a very small portfolio of natural gas, and then the wind stops blowing, and it's a cloudy day, and you suddenly don't have those, and you ask natural gas to turn on 50% suddenly, that that's just not realistic, because what is upstream is not able to turn on that fast. Is that a realistic conversation? I, I think that is that is the conversation that needs to take place. Uh, natural, gas, uh, natural gas plants are the most flexible that we have in the system to accommodate the variability that we see with large amounts of variable resources. And it is a real challenge for the natural gas industry to provide that kind of capacity that quickly. It's not designed to do that. But that's what the electric industry needs. And this is the question that I think policymakers and probably legislators are going to have to tackle, which is how do we create a construct for natural gas to be able to serve these very unique needs of the electric system for which it's not designed to do. Right. And that's going to require a fair amount of investment and some important policy. And that'll require some storage and other things we've talked exactly. about before. Uh, increased storage capacity for natural gas can offset some of that as well. Exactly. I'd love to get into a dialogue with you. I just don't have time on this. Uh, but you had some really interesting conversations about home heating oil versus natural gas in the Northeast and some of the challenges there. I'm always fascinated when I talk to my friends from New England who want to talk to me about carbon footprint when home heating oil has a 40% plus higher carbon footprint than natural gas does. In the Midwest, we use natural gas. They use home heating oil, then lecture us about carbon footprint. It's always a fascinating conversation, but love to be able to have that sometime. We have a great dinner conversation ahead of us. Senator Wyden. Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Chairman thank you for holding this very important um, hearing. I kind of start with this discussion by saying your grandfather's power lines are not fit, are, are were for your grandfather's weather events. And what we have to have is a modern system, modern system of power lines to deal with today's uh, weather events. And this morning I introduced um, legislation to begin the modernization of America's power uh, infrastructure so that we can uh, deal with these horrendous weather events that we have been seeing uh, around, the, around the country. Uh, Oregon saw a once in a century windstorm uh, last fall that just ignited horrible wildfires. We just had massive uh, power outages uh, in our state. I spent days in a dark basement and members of Congress are able 
after a few days to get up and get on with their lives. But we had a lot of Oregonians who had been hurting even before this happened, and now they're in even worse shape. So this is a huge matter of public uh, safety as well as uh, a jobs issue, a climate uh, issue. And my uh, legislation creates incentives for the private sector to step up and put in place those more modern uh, systems so that we can deal with today's blackouts and wildland uh, fires. And this means everything from strengthening <clears throat> utility poles and power lines, undergrounding equipment when possible, and cleaning brush and hazard trees. So my question is for Mr. Uh, Wood, the former chairman of the Federal Energy Regulatory uh, Commission. Mr. Wood, as you heard me say, grandfather, power lines, okay for grandfather weather, not fit for today. And so I introduced legislation to update the system. We would make available uh, funds uh, for uh, agencies like power marketing uh, at Bonneville and utilities to under install some of the changes that uh, I'm talking about, uh, underground power lines and uh, uh, strengthening overhead lines and installing equipment to monitor um, the grid during the serious weather. What do you think of something like this? And uh, and what kind of additional funding do you think would be necessary to harden the power grid, especially in rural areas? Uh, nice to see again, Senator Wyden. Uh, I cannot emphasize enough how the importance, the robustness of an infrastructure at both the local distribution level and up at the transmission level is for the future. The impact of uh, severe changes in the weather that we've all lived through and Actually, I was so busy with our own outages in Texas, I wasn't aware of what y'all had gone through in Oregon. That was quite substantial. I, uh, I think that the hardening of the uh, infrastructure has a cost, and that is always, from my regulatory mindset, the, 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 okay. the, the tussle that we have to do. With the larger utilities, it's, uh, it's easier to recover that cost over a large area, I'm, and I've been a big fan of recovering transmission costs over the RTOs or the larger areas. I know we don't have those in the West yet, but that's been a great way to pay for big transmission. But the, the, the rural areas are oftentimes in, um, in co-ops or small, um, small utilities that don't have the ability to really internalize the broad costs uh, just within their company. And so that is, uh, I understand that your bill uh, attempts to address some of that through a cost sharing mechanisms. I think that's, we can't leave rural America behind. I think we've learned during COVID, we can't do it on broadband, but we have never been able to do it uh, on uh, electrification since we fixed that issue a century ago. And it, it, it's no different today, you're right. We're not, it's not the grandfather's lines, but um, we've got to keep it 21st century for uh, all of America. And, and starting with the rural, the rural uh, aspects that you're talking about, in your bill make a lot of sense to me. Well, thank thank you, and uh, we've appreciated your in, input, uh, you know, over the years. And that's the whole point of the ten billion dollar matching grant uh, uh, program for uh, organizations like Power Marketing Administrations. That's that's Bonneville because there are going to be some costs associated with this. But to me, there are also huge costs if we do nothing, and we saw that all over the country, whether it's Texas, whether it's Oregon, we've seen it all over the country. Same question for you, uh, Mr. Gabriel, um, with respect to funding for the types of activities that I just outlined, uh, uh, do you think that'd be very useful? Is that uh, something we can build on? Uh, absolutely, certainly any type of non-reimbursable funding that we could get to help bolster the system. Keep in mind, we already put $160 million or so every year in the WAPA system. Of course, the challenge, as uh, Mr. Wood said, is most of WAPA's customers, many like BPAs, are very small municipals, co-ops, and rural folks. So it's uh, adding a significant burden to them would be a challenge. But any money that's available, we want to add more sensors. We want to make sure that we are bolstering lines. And something as simple oh. as switching from wood poles to, to steel is a huge expense, but something that would clearly help grid resilience. Well, thank, thank you both, and we're going to want your counsel uh, on this. As with a lot, lot of issues, people are going to say, can we afford it? 
I think when you look at the other side of the coin, you can't afford not to uh, do this. And I appreciate both of you. Thanks for the time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Marshall. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good to be here today. Thanks all the, the witnesses. I want to focus on the, the financial aspect of this just for a second. I feel like I'm here with the weight of three million Kansans who are waking up to utility bills, which are just through the roof. I feel like I have the weight of 90, 100 different municipalities who are buying natural gas on the spot market. Municipalities who in, in three days' time spent more than they were planning on spending in the next five years. And the questions I'm going to ask you are questions I've been asked dozens of times that I don't have an answer yet. Uh, so please don't take them personally, but somehow I got to get answers to figuring out what happened financially. Um, certainly we saw on the spot market, uh, the rates went up at least 10, you know, multiple of 10, sometimes more than that. I understand what happened to the supply. I understand that the wind turbines froze, the, the gas ads uh, froze, uh, that natural gas plants were affected, uh, that some of the coal was frozen together by snow and, and all those things happening. But one thing that's been pointed out to me is as we saw this spike in the, in the price of it go up and stay up for three days, it went down so quickly. If it was just supply demand, Mr. Wood, how would you answer that? Why would the price go down so, so quickly um, if there was truly a, a, supply, a supply shortage? How did it go down quickly in three days? And if there was anything nefarious, on where, where would you look? Uh, Senator, on, on gas or yeah. on power? Let's talk on natural gas. Yes, on sir. The, ga the gas issue, clearly, once, once uh, constraints are overcome, whether that's wellheads come back online, you're right. That would generally be something that would be phased oh. in. I mean, we went from 20 uh, BCF coming out of Texas, for example, down to about 10 over that full week. So through the 15th through the 19th, Monday through Friday, it went down. And um, I don't, so you're talking about the price going back down to 10 from 900? It, it, it went down really quickly. It's, it, it's, um, it was an issue when we looked in the California energy crisis that Senator Cantwell referred to earlier. It, it is always, um, it's a very open and transparent market. Scarcity pricing and market manipulation sometimes are two sides of the same coin. It depends what a jury thinks about it. But when you've got a, <clears throat> when you've got a scarce uh, supply of something, you want to charge for it. In Texas, for example, I think probably in most of the states, our attorney general is pursuing actions now uh, looking at gas and power trades because it is illegal to uh, who, price gouge if, in an in a emergency. Well, so you brought up the term price gouging. Who, who would have profited from this? Would, would, would it have been on the, on the markets, people that are playing the markets? Was it the, the pr producer that, that owned the gas? Well, who profited in, in this scenario? Whoever has the, whoever has, it, it, I think in general economics, whoever has a precious commodity at a time, it's most precious. And so that could be um, the uh, person who has it in storage, the person who's flowing it from a wellhead, whoever has title to that gas at that time, it could be anybody. It could be, uh, you know, a landowner in the middle of Kansas or Oklahoma or Texas that has title or, or royalties to the gas. So. It's, um, it's, it's, it honestly depends on where you are at the moment and where the gas is, uh, where the title to the gas is at that moment. How could we figure out who, who had it then? Who's, how could we follow the money? It took us years in, uh, in the California. Are you, are you convinced that we used all the storage up that we had? I do not have any data that tells me. Does, does anybody know if we, we used all the storage, storage up? Any of the other witnesses? I, I do not. Who can explain to me? Am I am I past my time? Nope, I still got a minute. You're left. right. You got one minute. One minute left. Um, you know, I'm I'm going to guess it's it's Mr. Wood. How could FERC investigate if there was anything nefarious? What does that process look like? And I'm not saying there is. I'm just it's just hard for me to imagine. Uh, just prices going up exponentially, and, and again, I think of that, you know, my parents on a fixed income, what's happening to their electric bill and their heating bill coming up right, right now as well. How would FERC investigate this? Uh, FERC does have authority over market manipulation, uh, or just markets in general, in the interstate markets. Of course, interstate natural gas pipelines serve Kansas 
Oklahoma and, and parts of Texas as well. We have an intrastate state that's separate. But um, the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, they were certainly involved with us 20 years ago when we unpacked the issues in the California crisis. The, the state attorneys general, uh, as I mentioned, the one in Texas is already investigating this issue. Um, those 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 three three camps, FERC, CFTC, for the futures. For in your experiences, that takes decades to go through. Well, that no, it doesn't. I mean, you can unpack in this digitized age. We have a lot more capability that in 2021 than we did in 2001 to review um, trades in this matter or in any matter much more expeditiously. Yeah. Thank you. I'm past my time. I yield back. Thank you, Senator. And now we have Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I spend a good deal of my professional life in energy. I've developed hydro projects, biomass projects, wind projects, and energy efficiency. And I want to add the, the one, the, the watchword of today's hearing seems to be diversity is good. I want to add another phrase. There is no free lunch in energy. <laughs> Everything has costs and benefits, and they need to be carefully calculated and weighed as we're moving through. And of course, one of the costs is contribution of CO2 uh, to climate change. First, Mr. Wood, a uh, somewhat facetious question, but can you tell us unequivocally that wind turbines did not cause the problem in Texas? They did not cause the problem. There were honestly, the only thing was like gas and coal and Everything clear, suffered. Every, everything could have helped solve it more faster. But, you know, wind was slow to get back, and so was coal, and so was gas. And, and I want to mention that the wind project that I worked on in Maine has been online in 10 years in Maine, there and it's go. never been down because of the cold that I know of. It was a question of their not weatherizing their, their turbines. So there's nothing correct. intrinsic in the wind power that can't survive cold, cold weather. Uh, uh, Mr. Rob, uh, and, and I don't want to dwell on this, I think you said something important in your earliest testimony. I consider the gas pipeline infrastructure part of the grid. Because of the use, of the, the dependency in New England, it's 60%, as you know, of our electric supply. And we've got to treat it that way. And we've got to be sure that it's regulated and protected. And I'm surprised in this hearing nobody's talked about cyber. Because after an immediate weather event, cyber is our next most dangerous problem. And I'm particularly worried about the gas pipeline system. So, uh, Mr. Rob, I realize you don't have that in your jurisdiction. It's not even in FERC's jurisdiction, but we've got to, it seems to me we've got to, we got to remedy that. Mr. Rob, uh, on cyber, do you pen test your utilities? Do you do uh, uh, red teaming on your utilities, uh, cybersecurity? Uh, we do not, but the Department of Energy does. Okay. I would, I would urge you to do so, too. I don't think it would hurt to have multiple, because the grid is probably one of the primary targets in terms of a catastrophic uh, uh, cyber attack. Uh, my friend from PJM, Mr. Athena, uh, what are we going to have to do in terms of modifications to the grid to accommodate the growth of electric vehicles? Obviously going to be an additional strain on the grid. Most of it will probably come at night. But uh, can you give me just a short answer on what you anticipate? Yeah, yeah. it's a really thoughtful question, Senator King. In terms of electric vehicles, Part of the benefit of them is that the charging does come at night and the grid is built, both the transmission grid and the distribution grid is built for peak load. And so load is less at night. And so some of this uh, electric vehicle load will just sort of fit in under the existing grid. I do think they're going to have to be- It would actually have the, it, it, it would have the impact actually of lowering transmission and distribution costs for all consumers because you'd be using more kilowatts, kilowatt hours on the same infrastructure. Is that correct? Yeah, it might lower the unit cost, it wouldn't lower the total cost. Right. Um, but I think the, the really exciting part of electric vehicles, and PGM did a, um, a study with the University of Delaware, uh, Delaware on uh, vehicle to grid. We actually piloted having vehicles provide regulation services off of their batteries. And, uh, you know, people were able to earn $100 a month um, in the pilot. So I think there's a lot of capability that will come to the grid that hopefully can add resilience through EVs as well. Great. Thank you very much. M Mr. Snellenberger, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I think I disagree with pretty much everything you've said, uh, and I'd like to spend some yeah, time I, with you offline to discuss it. Uh, but you did a calculation, which you announced uh, 
of how much it's cost to do exactly. renewables. You remember that? You said $116 billion or something like that. I'd like you to do that calculation again for this committee if all of that capacity and energy came from new nuclear power. I'd, I'd like to see that. Uh, I'd like to see that calculation. Yeah, we did two calculations, actually. We did a calculation that found that if Germany had spent the $580 billion that it's planning on spending on renewables, a nuclear not only would have 100 percent. I, I would like you to do the energy. calculation that I asked you to do because nuclear is unbelievably expensive, multiples of anything else. So if you would please do that calculation of just take exactly the, the capacity and energy that you use for the renewables and pretend that instead of renewables, it would come from new uh, newly franchised uh, nuclear plants, and let's see what the comparison is. Yeah, and we, we have do done those. What, what gets misleading is when you're counting the electricity cost from a solar panel when the sun is shining and imagining that that's the cost that you're paying for a solar powered grid. All of the transmission and storage and all of the additional costs associated with having variable renewables are externalized onto the grid. Did you include those in your calculation? We did. And, yeah, and, so give me it on for nuclear. This is a simple question. Sure. Just take the number of megawatts and the production and calculate it if it were new nuclear and give yeah. me the number. Can you Sir, do that? Sir, you didn't let me finish the answer, which was that we you did haven't. I don't California want you to give me the answer Germany. now. I'm running out of time. I want you to give me the answer in writing. If you could do that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, and I just need you to specify what the question is. Is it for the entire United States? I just want you to do the same. You, you announced a calculation in your testimony that was some big number, $160 billion was the incremental cost of renewables for this amount of power for, I don't know whether it was a year or five years. You, you, that was in your uh, opening statement. I just want you to do the same calculation for the same amount of power as if it was generated by new nuclear plants. Oh, I see. You mean the the University of Chicago study that found that renewables cost $125 yes, billion across that's 29 it. states? That, yes. Senator, that. I would be delighted to do that and send it to you. Thank you. Uh, and one other, well, uh, I, think that, I think I'm out of time. Uh, I would like, <laughs> Mr. Gabriel, for the record, if you could uh, give me an answer to whether you consider the, the grid instability problems a wires problem or a technology software problem? In other words, do we have to rebuild all the wires and towers or do we have to modify the way the grid is managed? And I'm out of time, so if you could supply that for the record to the committee, I'd appreciate it. Thank Happy you. To hear, Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation today. So appreciate uh, the chair and ranking member uh, holding this hearing. Let, let me just say from the outset, I also agree with uh, 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 my good colleague, Senator King, on electric vehicles. There's a potential there. They, we saw the benefits, particularly in what happened in this winter storm on President's Day in Texas. And uh, so uh, I, I have a lot of legislation around this space. It, it just it is the future and we should not ignore it. But let me let me jump back to the issue of winterization and weatherization uh, and what we were seeing in some of these winter storms and um, the, the infrastructure. Um, so Mr. Estana, let me ask you this. In your written testimony, you noted that PJM instituted incentives and penalties, which prompted your power generators to winterize. And as a result, you said you have seen improvements in generator performance in the face of extreme weather. So. In your opinion, would these necessary improvements have been made if PGM did not institute those incentives and penalties? Senator Master, that, uh, I can give you my opinion. It's impossible to know for sure because we didn't run the contract rule. Um, what we did was we did implement performance yeah, penalties them, after the 2014 uh, <laughs> polar vortex. And what we saw happen, uh, and I believe that the performance penalties uh, certainly helped it happen was that the forced outage rate went from 22% back in 2014 to less than 10% in this most recent winter event. Um, and so there's, there's certainly an improving, there's a significant improvement. And I think the performance penalties and the incentives have helped. Well, and thank you for that, because I, that's the question I have then for the rest of the panelists. Is, is there a role for Congress to play here um, to ensure um, that we are addressing the needed winterization and weatherization uh, across the country. And uh, if there is a role for Congress, what's the most effective incentive to compel those needed investments? Uh, that's what I'm looking for. So, l Mr. Rob, let me start with you. Uh, sure. Do you have any ideas on how, how, what role Congress could play? 
So I think with the existing authorities that we have, that Congress has already given to uh, to FERC and to NERC, we can address the weatherization issue within the, the power generation sector. I think the area that Congress should reflect on and potentially take action is to think about how that extends into the natural gas and fuel sectors. Um, because having a great winterized plant with no fuel in front of it isn't very valuable. And uh, that's where our authorities right now stop. And I think that's an important thing to uh, to work on. Thank you. Mr. Gabriel, your thoughts? Well, uh, I couldn't agree more than uh, with Jim. Natural gas is really the, the fuel that we use in these emergency situations. Of course, running hydropower, uh, we have, we're fairly well winterized, other than obviously there's times when the uh, the the rivers freeze and we've got some challenges. But it's really, what do we need for backup fuel? And th that line at natural gas is absolutely critical. Thank you. Mr. Wood? I would say, uh, Senator, that the uh, the, tech, for the Texas example being, of course, the one I'm coming from, mm -hmm. the legislature here, uh, our legislature in Austin has bills before it that would require weatherization for both the natural gas and the power industry. And I expect in light of what happened last month, those will be adopted and they will be stout. And that's uh, to me akin to the airline industry is you don't have standards and, and good ideas, you have rules or you don't say anything at all. And so the this is the rules and it didn't work in t after 2011, uh, so it'll work now uh, because it'll be compulsory and there will be performance penalties. And so, and that's what I want to verify. I know Mr. Rob talked about there's an investigation uh, underway right now with respect to what happened in Texas. At the end and the conclusion of that investigation, how can we be ensured that Texas will take action, the appropriate action? And you're, what I'm hearing from you is that um, there will be penalties associated with uh, the, their failure to take any appropriate action. Yes, ma'am. Unfortunately, due to the short time frame of the Texas legislature, I think the remedy will come before the analysis is through. But there is broad consensus that there that this uh, weatherization issue, again, as the as the weather events become more extreme, we we if we don't do it now, we'll have to do it again in the future. So let's just do it now. And I think getting that authority clearly in the states and other states uh, may already have this uh, authority. Um, I'm, so I'm, I would. I would probably check to make sure that states uh, can't do it. If they can't do it, then the feds certainly should, but let the state closest to the people handle that problem. But obviously mine did not. So uh, we, got the, uh, we got the message from our citizens last month to fix the problem and uh, bipartisan bills have been filed in that regard. Thank you. I guess my time is up. Thank you, everyone. And our final panelist, uh, no, our final Senator to grill our panelists is going to be Senator Kelly. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a lot of the, uh, you know, when you're, at, when you're at the end of the line here, a lot of the uh, questions you have have already been asked and answered. And I uh, appreciate uh, all of you uh, for being here in person and virtually. Uh, I want to start with Mr. Gabriel. So I want to expand a little bit on uh, what Senator Cortez Masto was uh, was getting at um, uh, and expand on, you know, how climate change is affecting water supplies and hydropower generation in the Colorado River Basin. So during last year's extreme heat wave in California, so we're going to transition for a second from Texas to California, energy from the Glen Canyon Dam and the Hoover Dam and Parker Davis Dam that could have been delivered to Arizona customers was called upon to keep the California grid from completely collapsing. So against the backdrop of some climate change and we have increasing population growth in the state of Arizona uh, and in the Colorado River Basin in general, uh, do you think hydropower is going to become a more valuable resource in years to come? And should WAPA and its ratepayers be compensated for supporting um, black starts when power grids in other areas go down? Mr. Yeah, thanks for the question, Senator Kelly. Certainly, uh, WAPA's customers are compensated in terms of sales, but hydropower is going to become more and more valuable as we add more renewables to the grid because of its baseload characteristics. 
Certainly in an emergency situation, hydropower has got serious advantages in that we don't need electricity to make electricity, which is kind of a typical situation in many power plants. Mm -hmm. One of the real challenges, though, that we have is hydropower is not necessarily compensated for its black start capability. And of course, that's the capability of rebuilding the grid should the lights go out. And I think it's something that really needs to be dealt with over time. Uh, and I know there's a, it's sort of an embedded question in there. Uh, we always work to replace the power for our customers in Arizona and other states by buying it on the market. But remember, first and foremost, physics beats philosophy. So we want to keep the physics of the system alive and work diligently to make sure that we do whatever we can to keep the grid up and operating. What would it take to, to, to put that compensation in place? How would that work? Well, I think there's several models that can be used. Uh, in several of the markets, hydropower is compensated for its black start and for its reliability and for its capacity. Uh, given the fact that we really don't have a market yet in much of the West, I think that's going to be one of the critical issues that has to be determined as the West decides what its future is going to do, what it's going to look like in market. All right. Thank you. And, and for Mr. Wood, I, kn I know we talked a lot about Texas here already today and, um, you know, this, the, the, the weather event you know, here recently curtailed about 40 percent of the gas that gets delivered to Southwest Gas, which has a service territory across southern Arizona. Yeah. Uh, during the event, the price of gas for Southwest Gas went up from about 250, I think two dollars and fifty cents for a decatherm to about three hundred dollars. So uh, more than an order of magnitude. You know, fortunately, we have some pretty good storage in the state that allowed us to weather the storm in Texas, but the effect on Arizona customers might not be fully known um, because the way Southwest Gas does their bill, billing on a 12-month uh, rolling average. I know we talked about this a little bit, and we only have a little bit of time left, but, you know, I understand that Texans are hesitant to embrace federal energy regulation. But what assurances do Arizona customers have that Texas will move quickly to address the vulnerabilities to extreme weather? Well, I wish I could be the one to guarantee we're going to do it. But, I mean, there are elected people back home working on this issue today. It was an emergency item added by Governor Abbott immediately after the, uh, the event last month. Senator Kelly, and uh, again, a very strong bipartisan hearings last week on these issues. I think the bill is in markup probably in the next seven days. So, and, the, and so the Texas legislature is in session right now. Do you know when that session ends? Um, Memorial Day. Memorial Day. And then it's, so if it doesn't get done before Memorial Day, it'll be another two years. Our special session, which is possible that because of the energy issues being so important, those will perhaps, if not resolved by the end of... I think this is done before then, though, Senator. I mean, the dynamics are, are too intense. Has, has Governor Abbott committed to a special session to, to get this done if it goes beyond Memorial Day? I have not heard that. I honestly think he expects it to be done before they even do the budget. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I'm going to thank all the witnesses uh, for being here with us this morning and for your uh, insight, responsiveness. Uh, to all of our questions on this extremely important topic, and it's truly uh, timely, and we appreciate very much the effort you made to be here. So members will have until 6 p.m. tomorrow to submit additional questions for the record. Committee stands adjourned.